The rain fell endlessly in Radnorshire. It came in lines across the hills, blown against the walls of the barns at Wundunvan, oozing through the weatherboards and pouring through the holes in the roof. Across the farm, every sheep path, every ditch and furrow became a stream, until the hillside was a web of water, and thick brown arms reached from the edge of the bottom field into the pond on the edge of the forestry beyond. Radnorshire is where I grew up, and so it draws on a lot of my childhood memories. The cycle of the seasons, the farming, and all of that sort of stuff. But I wouldn't call it autobiographical, but I'd always wanted to use that material in some way. Sitting between the big open doors of the barn, Andrew would look out at the lines and the circles in the puddles. Pressed around him, the dogs nipped him and nuzzled him to play, warm, damp and sharp smelling. But Andrew stroked them almost without noticing, staring across the yard where the circle shimmered between the house and himself, between the footprints of the cattle and the ugly brown ruts of the tractor. It was so beautiful that a dizzy feeling rose up in him, like he felt when he was going to sleep, and it was as if there were nothing but these lines and circles spreading away from him as far as he could see. The book essentially is about two main characters, two boys of seven years old, and they live on two neighbouring hill farms, either side of a hill in Radnorshire. One of them, Robin, comes from a family of English immigrants, ex-hippies, I suppose you might call them, whereas the other, Andrew, belongs to a local family, but a, a couple who are, I suppose, sort of half mad and who neglect him completely so that he grows up almost like a feral child among the sheepdogs. Adam lifted Andrew from the edge of the sink and she wrapped him in a big white towel, holding him to her chest and rocking him gently, so subsumed in the folds that he looked like a baby. No, Adam agreed, we can't send him back tonight. This time, she said, Adam, we've got to call the social services. I mean, he's a child, for Christ's sake. I don't care if everyone else in the village thinks we're meddling. We've got to do something. The claw glass is a small pocketbook size convex mirror of blackened glass that was used by artists and tourists of the late 18th century. And they would stand literally with their back to the view and they would look in this little mirror in order to see an image that, to their minds, corresponded with uh, picturesque ideals. It ties in with the book essentially because Andrew, in the ruins of the house where he lives with his parents, finds a clawed glass and becomes very attached to it. And it becomes for him a symbol of the possibility of his becoming socially normal. And he carries this fragile way of seeing around with him. Along the hedges and on the hillsides where the bracken was pushing in spears from the moist ground, the blossom ceased to be an aspect of the general greyness, like the sheep, like the flowers and the butterflies, and suddenly the hawthorn trees, the damsons and the crab apples were cascades of white in the hot sunlight. Summer had, it seemed, been progressing all along, behind the lines of the rain and the low, sullen clouds, in the elevated regions where the buzzards were once again spiralling, surveying their dominions, the shining streams and ponds teeming with tadpoles, the green-brown closeness of the hilltops, the twisting roads and dingles, and the woods where bluebells rippled like water, and where there were orchids if you knew where to look for them, or sheep if they'd happened to get there first. Ever since the first draft of it that I wrote, I've always loved it, and I always will love it, because it's my background, it's all of me is in it, and I don't know that I will ever write anything that I love so much again.